Welcome to the Secrets of Success podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ken Keyes. Well, today's show is a little bit different as I'm actually a guest on Melissa Daly's show, and we're going to share that interview of me that she was hosting for her show on my show. And so thank you for that, and thank you for listening, and we thank Melissa for sharing and allowing us to sort of leverage that interview. And we're talking about health and wellness, and who is not discussing stress these days? And so one of the areas, I have a diploma in nutrition and genetics, and we have an assessment called the Stress Indicator and Health Planner, but also an online e-course called Dying to Live. And so I reference that, and my encouragement is, as you uh, listen to this show, is that you consider uh, completing the assessment and or registering for the e-course. We'll have it in the show notes with Secrets of Success so that you can participate in it. You know, one of the things around health and wellness, and I'm guilty of this, even though I teach it, is that we're responsible for our own health conditions. You know, our input equals output, what we're doing, what we're not doing, how we're treating ourselves in all areas of our life, those are the stressors that are affecting us. And the research is clear, 90 to 95% of illness is lifestyle related and preventable. So we can do something about it, which is the great news. So here's the show, but before we get there, thanks again for being a great Secrets of Success podcast listener and part of the tribe. If you like what we're doing, please pass it on, share it, leave a positive comment on whatever platform you're listening on. So here's my interview with Melissa around stress and wellness. Hope you enjoy. Welcome back to the Don't Wait for Your Wake Up Call podcast. I'm super excited to bring you an amazing guest today, Dr. Ken Keys. Welcome, Ken. Well, it's uh, great to see you again, and it was nice to have you on our podcast, and it's just a delight to be able to serve you and your audience. And I can't believe how this time is flying. It, we did that podcast back in December. Here we are recording on the very last day of April. This is coming out in June. Time is flying. We are a busy, busy um, human population, right? And Aren't we? Aren't we, though? And that ties into our topic of today, which is stress. But first, let me introduce you and your all your qualifications. Dr. Mm -hmm. Ken Keese is an expert on leadership, purpose, wellness, and the foremost global authority on personality and behavioral assessments that increase and multiply your success rate. Ken has co-created CRG's proprietary development models and written over 4 million words of content for 40 business training programs and 500 plus articles. He is an expert on assisting individuals, families, teams, and organizations to realize their full potential and to live on purpose. And he also has a diploma in nutrition and genetics. So he, has, he is so qualified. I'm so excited to have you here to talk about this important topic of stress because mm. we know the world is the most stressed out it has ever been. Oh, and for we sure. also know that stress is damaging our health. So this is a really important topic. So thank you for joining me today. Uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And that was just a snippet of your bio. So I would love to invite you to uh, introduce yourself and share your story and how you came into this line of work. Well, actually, I, I grew up on a dairy farm. I'm the eldest uh, male. I was the third generation on the farm. I came back from agricultural college, which is where I got my nutritional uh, diploma and degree. I have eventually left the farm because dad and I couldn't work together. That was stressful for sure. <laughs> uh, and then I got into a job where I actually was in sales, but actually I was a nutritionist for dairy cattle. So it was just really working with and optimizing the performance of them. And then I got into this industry of professional development way back in the 80s. This is my 32nd year. I can't believe it. We're, we're, you know, when we're recording this, maybe it's a legacy thing in your, now it's 40 years later. Uh, and I transitioned into doing sales training, being a sales performer. And it just grew out of that. And, and I've been connected to Consulting Resource Group since 1990, and I bought the company nearly 20 years ago in 20, 2002. And then 
spent 10 years revising all the content in the assessments that the company had acquired or developed over that period of time. So this is now our 41st year as a company and my 32nd year of doing this. And then of course I have a real passion around wellness and health and stress as a component of our holistic development process. Now what's interesting in this whole thing is my grade nine teacher said I would never amount to anything because I couldn't read or write. So it was when I was doing my MBA, it was discovered I was dyslexic and so that contributed to it. Another thing that occurred, which was my personal journey and just passion around this, in 1987, I was diagnosed as manic, manic depressive and put on lithium. And my friend of mine, because I was part of uh, the National Speakers Association, she said to me, she says, Ken, you, you don't have the really the diagnosis or the symptoms of somebody who's depressed. There's something else that's going on. So I'm going to ask you to ask your doctor to do this, this assessment. So I went to my doctor and on my insistence, he didn't offer it. He said, I want to do a glucose tolerance test and then discovered I was extreme hypoglycemic. I wasn't manic depressive. I was ready to kill somebody when I was on those antidepressants because I didn't, my body didn't need them. And so just really my advocation or an advocate for really alternative health, functional medicine, that's our belief system. And then when I bought a, a CRG, we always had the stress indicator and health planner and it's our most thorough tool. And it was co-developed with Dr. Gwen Faulkner who runs a wellness center in California is that we wanted to say, what, what are the things that I can do, the strategies to optimize my health and reduce my stress? And that assessment's called the Stress Indicator and Health Planner. So here we are now, after 20 years of owning the company, of all this writing, who knew that I would even be an author? And uh, I want to phone up my grade nine English teacher every once in a while and say, excuse me, look what I've done. So just to kind of uh, let the grade nine child out of me. <laughs> just release that, right? And you know what? I hear that so often where teachers say that to children. And especially back then, I think that now there's a lot more awareness around the impact that mm. that can have. And teachers are, you know, maybe think a little bit more before they open their mouth and speak because right. that can be so detrimental, obviously. But perhaps in your case, it also drove you to show him or her that you could be more. <laughs> well, um, there you are. <laughs> I know I look really young, but I went to school when there wasn't computers. So the invention of the computer, and we were talking off air about, you know, computers can be a love hate relationship. I get that. They can be stressful when they don't work. But with the invention of the program word in these red lines, then whenever I was misspelling things or there were grammar suggestions that really helped. And I write through my fingertips now. So in school, of course, we had to do, you know, handwriting, but now with typing, that's, I, I almost refuse to handwrite most things, unless I'm just leaving a, a note for myself. So, you know, my focus is really uh, to write through my fingertips. And when I did my MBA and it was forcing me to do all these papers, that's really where the writing side started to sort of develop in my thirties. And yeah, phenomenal that we have this new technology that can support people's different styles of learning, right? Oh, absolutely. And we actually have a learning style tool. And the other side, of course, is now you have voice to text. Yes. Uh, so there's really no excuse to not have your work transcribed in some form or another. And, you know, all of these factors, and I think this is where we, you know, connected initially through our podcast group and then having you on our show is that all of these factors contribute to stress or reducing it. It's like, it's not any single factor. There's multiple things that I need to look at to be able to reduce my stress, but also to say, what is contributing to it? It could 100%. be a myriad of different things. Exactly. In all areas of our life. And not all stress is bad. It's just that when we get into that state of chronic stress, that it starts to be damaging to our health. That being the state when our body is in fight or flight mode, survival mode, and it thinks it needs to get you to safety. It mm. doesn't know the difference between this heightened level of stress as different stresses stack onto our shoulders versus us being hunted by a lion or a tiger back in our hunter gather days. 
And that is the state that unfortunately we are getting stuck in because stress mm -hmm. does stack, right? And as you say, there's so many different um, aspects of our life where that stress can be stacking and but creating awareness around it instead mm -hmm. of just kind of going through life and trying your best to you know do your best, which everybody is, but we get into kind of that tunnel vision and we block out our body talking to us or the signals. And when we slow down for a minute to just really step into, okay, where am I at? What yeah. is going on in my life? And what small steps can I take to be lowering my stress? That's when we can start getting ourselves out of that chronic stress state. Mm -hmm. And that's where your stress assessment indicator tool is so helpful. And I use it with my clients in my programs because it breaks down the stresses in different aspects of your life. So if you want to talk about that a little bit, that would be awesome. <clears throat> exactly. And I think a lot of times when somebody says I'm stressed, it's a very big question. And so the responsibility of the person who is stressed and or the practitioner or coach that they're working with, and as you were using the tool to serve others, and just so people notation, they don't need certification to use it because it's user friendly. We've done all the work on the research on the back end so that you're going to be assisting others to get to the next level. But one of the things we did, we had a client work with us for 25 years, 6,000 employees, and said this was the most valuable piece that they did for their entire uh, company because they want to be preemptive. Is if I say, you know, I'm stressed, it's too big of a question. We need to kind of distill it down. And so we break it down into five different categories in our assessment. So we can just talk about each one how each one contributes to our condition in life, right? Input equals output, but it's also where is this coming from? So first of all, we kind of manage and we get people to document sort of distress. So how are you feeling? Do you have lots of headaches? Are you, you know, insomnia, um, gaining weight, losing weight, uh, anxiety, panic attacks, um, disinterest in life, all these mood swings. All these things are contributing as clues of my current condition. Now, I don't know exactly what stress is creating that yet, but at least I'm starting to benchmark my condition. So, well, it's not normal, Ken, that you would just get two hours of sleep a night. You should get slightly more than that. And I'm being fictitious or, or facetious. Yes. But the next one, the next category is okay, interpersonal. I'm just going to stop you there for one second. I think that sure. section is really important because it does create awareness around the symptoms that mm. we have and that our body is talking to us. And symptoms are a sign that our body is asking us to do something different. However, we haven't been taught to listen to the symptoms of our body per se, and it's been kind of lost in maybe the last three or four generations of the human race. And we have symptoms and what I find when working with people is that very often those symptoms get written off as not important messages such as, oh, it's just seasonal allergies or it's just aging or it's just my genetics mm. and I don't have to take action. But the reality is, is our body is asking us to take action and this just this very first section of your tool is highlighting those for people so that they can really start to see that picture mm -hmm. of just what their body is is saying to them. Yeah, and uh, emotional and just psychological things as well as part of that process. Now, the interesting thing you mentioned, you know, somebody says, well, it's my genetics, so is this the way it is, uh, bunk. When uh, even the WHO, who I don't really hold up high, but when they did the study said, what percentage of stress and illness is lifestyle related? Even their stats say 90 to 95%. So when people says, listen, I'm genetically predisposed to be obese or to be in this situation or to be chronically this way. No, that's not actually true. Now, as an agriculturalist, and I'm not trying to diss my agricultural friends, but we know that agricultural has changed. Yes. Pharmaceutical industry has changed. Yes. And so even the food sources have changed. So all of these things that come in, we've actually talked about that, I think, in the show that you did with us around. I actually wasn't no hate, guys, no hate. Yeah. In the 80s, I was a sales rep for Monsanto, and I sold Roundup to the farmers. Now, I was told then as a sales rep that oh, it biodegrades and there's no residual in the plants or the food or anything like that. And then, of course, by based on that, they created these Roundup-ready crops. 
So I spray them just before I harvest them. Well, now we know in that study that was in Canada in 2000 or 2019, every single cereal in Canada had trace amounts of glass phosphate. Okay, so I was misled. And so, there, so there's all these other factors that are contributing to my uh, situation. So you need to be aware of that input is causing output. Yes, and, and you get the wrong input. Yes, and if somebody say, well, it's genetically I'm predisposed, you know what, that's less than 5% of the population. Yeah. We are responsible and we have, now the beauty of that is, if I'm responsible, that also means I make choices that make changes and that's what you do with people to help them to be aware of what these changes are needed and what to do about it. And so that's why it's great that you're a health coach and helping people uh, from a functional medicine point of view. And for those of you that don't know what functional medicine means, you go to the root cause. I mean, my, my, one of my best friends is a medical doctor and he even says we have a sick care system, not a healthcare system. So what we're talking about in this show is that, okay, we're healthcare, we're around the advance. We're trying to say, okay, what is contributing to it? So after the, the distress things, items, we get into interpersonal stress. So, you know, relationships matter, relationships improve us. And of course, in the world in its upside down state is that we need to hug people. We need, because actually it proves that hugs actually improves oxytocin, improves sort of the biochemicals in our, in our body. We need to see each other people in our eyes and our faces and what's moving. Uh, and the other one is when we think about interpersonal stress is sometimes our own confidence, our own self-worth has contributed to stress in relationships, meaning somebody asked me to do something. I don't want to do it, but I've sort of acquiesced to it. And I've, I've complied when really I didn't want to do it. So now I'm feeling stressed because you asked me to do a job, but I didn't have my assertiveness in place to say no. Or there's some toxic relationships, dysfunctional toxic relationships that you are hanging out with or in, and they're contributing to the stress level. It could be at work because, well, I've got a terrible boss or somebody else toxic in the workplace and I'm not speaking up. Or the other side where uh, I'm the person contributing uh, contributing to the stress, meaning I have a short fuse. We know that as stress goes up, that people's management of self goes down, right? So that comes into play as part of the this whole uh, picture as well. And if I'm letting myself uh, kind of go off, then that's actually contributing to my stress. You're, are you familiar with Dr. Gottman's work in Seattle, no. Washington? I'm not. So, so Dr. Gottman is really a relationship expert. And he created a thing in Seattle called the Love Lab. And it's not what people think. It's really around couples who are in conflict. And he would get them engaged in their conflict discussion. And then he would record everything. And so what he determined was, is once we go over 100 beats per minute, we're no longer rational. And we then say and do things that we regret. Well, that means that I'm not in charge of self. Right. So if, if I'm self-centered, which human beings tend to be, and myself included, and I'm not managing self, then I'm actually contributing to my own stress. Yes. So Dr. David Burns wrote the book, Feeling Good, which is 500 pages of four point font. So if you really want to like get deep into psychology, you can read his book. But one of his quotes out of his book is that nobody makes you angry unless you let them. Yes. Very. You're 100% responsible and in charge of our emotional response and reactions. And it says, well, you offended me. No, no. You know, you might not agree with what I did. It might not be appropriate with what I did, but my response is always my choice. Yes. So I know as a viewer or listener right now, you dislike that. I dislike that accountability level. But if we are being triggered and letting ourselves being triggered into these negative emotional responses, we're contributing to a significant amount of stress in our system and our bodies and the cortisol goes up and all the things that you teach around ruining our, our, our health is based on these interpersonal areas. So managing that and all the different sides of that coin, right? Being uh, passive aggressive or being aggressive. Those are both stressful events, depending on, are you the perpetrator? <laughs> That's a pretty yes. strong word yeah. or the victim, but either way, I can stand in my own space and not let these things affect me. And most people disagree because the society now is that everybody's offended. Well, that's a choice. 
It is actually a dysfunctional from a healthy point of view, from a stress point of view. Now, uh, example is that somebody did something that was extremely inappropriate or offensive. You know, one of the things we want to do in this mix is we need to forgive those people. And we don't forgive them for them. We forgive them for us. You've heard this. This is like 100 years old. But if I'm in unforgiveness, it's sort of like me taking the poison and expecting you to die. So that is, we, many of you have heard that before, but it is a very good example of if I'm going to keep this bitterness, then I'm going to uh, really reduce my wellness and increase my stress. In the book, The Quest for Purpose, which you had on your desk before we started, there's yeah. a little chapter in there where I talk about the stress indicator and health planner, but there was research, and this was specific to divorced women. So I'm, this is not a gender bias thing. It was just that study is that uh, women who main, uh, maintain their bitterness after the divorce, on average, live seven years less. Seven years. Uh, I said, oh man, it was a UK study because yeah. that bitterness is putrid in yeah. your system. So this whole interpersonal side is just one little section within the stress indicator and health planner. But so, so, so important, right? Oh, always. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we give you a bunch of, go ahead. Sorry. I want to say what you are sharing right now, I learned going through my health coaching training, right? But if I go back just six years to when I was in the corporate world, I didn't know any of this. I didn't understand any of this. Mm. I was just, you know, trying to do the best I could as a mom, as a wife, and as an employee, right? And how many other people are in that boat today? that haven't had the opportunity to learn this, but they can learn it here Mm. and how important it is and how life changing it can be to understand the power of forgiveness, not to forgive the act, but to release that pent up emotion that you're carrying and move on with your life. Because when you hold on to that, you're the only one suffering. The other person probably doesn't even know. And you're still holding the on. reality is, is 97% of what people think about is not about you. It's about themselves. Exactly. So they're not thinking about you anyways. So exactly. get over yourself because we're kind of consumed with our own issues and what's going on and what's happening. So it's so, so true. true. I, I'm not suggesting that it's easy, no. but even as we used to have a counseling division in the new research around counseling, I think the old counseling, it's broken. And that is, a lot of times people would go through and relive the event yes. over and over and talk about the event. It's actually now proven that's not beneficial. What you want to do is talk about where you want to go. Exactly. And you release that. By talking about the event, you actually entrench it more. You know, in Dr. Carolyn Leaf's work in her book, Who Switched Off Your Brain, Who Switched On Your Brain, is she proved in her research is that if I think about something long enough and replay it in my mind, even though it's false, it then becomes my truth. That's, I mean, you those of us that have been married or have partners or have a significant other of some sort, if you ever been in a situation where you are certain, you are both certain this is what happened and it's polar opposite. You said this. No, I didn't know I said this. And so part of, so we have to be aware of, you know, we have our bias. We have implicit bias that we bring into these interactions, and then they contribute to the stress. So one of my suggestions in this, in uh, one of my other um, colleagues who I was fortunate enough to be invited to with Marshall Goldsmith, the number one executive coach in the world to New York, is that we need to kind of be aware of what are the triggers and to manage those. And so he was working with CEOs and executives. What takes you out? So you already know what takes you out. And so now you can preempt it. You start paying attention to what is it where you're, we actually uh, call it in our interpersonal training, uh, you learn to suspend, meaning to take your offense out of the picture and take your self-centeredness out of the picture. And so if I know that when you say this, this is going to take me out, then I stop doing that. The other thing is, so, so I know about it in advance and I start thinking about it in advance and I also say, okay, what does this cost me in terms of relationships or lost relationships or lost connections? And then you start planning for it. The other one that's kind of interesting, uh, human beings tend to um, practice uh, getting offended in inanimate objects. So you get offended to your computer, 
You get upset with your car because it breaks down. You get upset because the train was late or whatever. How has that helped? It hasn't helped anything. It and does. so even because you're, you're actually practicing a negative emotional response. So when you interact with the person, so stop that. So I remember when I was writing my MBA, it was one of my final papers. I had spent maybe 40, 60 hours in, on putting it together. And I made a mistake on my computer and I deleted it all. It was gone. It evaporated. Oh my goodness. And, uh, I hadn't printed anything. I didn't have anything saved. It was just gone. And I even got a tech in to try to recover it through the, you know, to decrypt it somehow or other. No luck. It just didn't work. I had to start over. And one of the things is I could have been angry. I could have been, yes, I was disappointed and I was upset to a certain degree, but I didn't get all livid over it because how was that going to help me to redo it? Right. I just phoned the professor. This is what happened. I need another week. My second paper was not near as good as my first one because <laughs> it was a short time, but I just went on with it. And right. so, you know, we all have choices about how we're going to respond. So that's one section. Now, the next section in the Stress Indicator and Health Planner is the area that you live in most, where we talk about nutrition and we talk about lifestyle. And so a lot of times people said, well, uh, I just want to kind of be mediocre or average or everything in moderation. Well, you know, if it's a little bit of cyanide, you know, just take a bit. It's just moderate. <laughs> it's just a moderate amount. What we want to teach is optimal health, health. And then from there, yes, we always have moments where, you know, we had a pizza or something like that, whatever was going on. That's we're my trying 80, to teach 20 rule. Yeah, exactly. And not to get stressed and do the guilt side, but right. know what optimum health is, not mediocre health. I love and that. Same thing from a lifestyle point of view. And that's what we're teaching in there. Now, if I had 13 nutritionists or 12 nutritionists in on this uh, Zoom call or on this a podcast, you know, how many opinions would you have about how to eat, right? 12 or 13 or 14 or even 15. So there are some principles, but nobody's really 100% in agreement on what it should do. So you need to do your own research. But if you were just do the principles that mom taught us 50 years ago, right? Just live, rich foods that if possible, organic, and you're probably going to be okay, stay away from the processed foods. And for me, because I was hypoglycemic, what contributed to it is I was like drinking a four liters, a gallon of Coke a day back then because I was trying to self-medicate. So if people understand uh, hypoglycemia, you get on a low and then you try and put sugar in your system, get a high and it just, you're up and down and you're just moody. It's just, it's just terrible. So you want to be able to stabilize that and then process breads and white breads and stuff like that are almost like injecting sugar in your veins too. Uh, so how can I manage and just make sure that I'm just looking at live uh, whole foods as much as possible. And so that's kind of the baseline. And as a nutritionist, the other thing that I really do believe in is that uh, supplements are important. Yes. Uh, and a lot of people say, well, I don't need it. We didn't need it a hundred years ago. And I said, well, okay, 100 and let's say the 1900s on average, our consumption of sugar, processed sugar was around five to 10 pounds per year. We're now, depending on who you listen to, it's over 150 pounds or over 50 kilos yeah. per year of sugar in some form or another. You actually look at the processed meats and you will see fructose corn syrup inserted yeah. in there. So in the 80s, when fructose corn syrup was invented, what most people don't realize, it doesn't break down in your body like other sugars. It gets stuck sort of in the liver and the kidney system. And it's a, it's a high stressor. And so just just look at the labels, avoid that as much as possible, and then you're probably pretty good. We talk about, okay, what's the baseline? It's vegetables. You know, that's the baseline. That Start with that. You know, fruits, nuts. I'm not a vegan, so uh, unprocessed meats and or whatever your protein source is going to be from there. Uh, I'm a dairy farmer, so I do like cheese. I'm okay with that and butter and some of those items there. But as far as, you know, it used to be that brains and grads were, uh, grains and <laughs> breads were on the baseline. They're at the very top. That's the least amount that you have yes. of those items there. And so you have all those components. So that's, I'll let you go into the nutritional stuff and tr teach other people more, but I can get into it because I will spend hours in this as part of my passion. Well, I know we side, could talk about it 
Absolutely for hours. But I do absolutely agree with you that with, you know, 12 different people in the room, you're going to have 12 different opinions. And But I agree with what you said, because what I teach is that each and every one of us has to figure out the right way to eat for our unique microbiome, which is as different to every other microbiome out there on the planet as our fingerprints. Therefore, there are over 7 billion different diets on the planet. And so working with a nutritionist is really powerful because they can help you figure out the right way to eat for your body. Mm. Well, there's many who have talked about body types and these body types have tendencies to this or this or this. And so it's just taking in consideration that, again, as you said, unique fingerprints, unique microbiome and, and probiotics and those kinds of things that people don't even think about for the most part are important because that's you know, when you talk about Dr. Mark Harmon's work or Dr. Furman's work, all of it talks about the gut goes to the brain, right? Exactly. So, uh, exactly. and in fact, the, you know, the research shows is that type three diabetes is really dementia. Exactly that too. And, and so that, and my stepfather-in-law passed away from that a couple of years ago and you just observed and you watched that. And part of what contributed to his situation is he had brain cancer. And a lot of times these chemicals and what we're consuming break down in the blood brain barrier and get into our body. And you don't want to do that. You want to try to avoid that as much as possible. And I think it's over 50% of 80 year olds will have some form of dementia or Alzheimer's by time they get to that age. Well, who needs that? Because we really want to talk about quality of life as much as quantity of life. Exactly. And what you're doing now will cost you. I don't know if you remember this show that was on for a short period of time on TLC, which was, honey, you're killing the kids. And there was some research done that if 13 year olds, uh, if, if kids by time they're 13 uh, get into this obesity situation, their metabolic system is extremely difficult to rectify when they get to be an adult. So if, if for, for parents, if your kids are telling you what they should eat, you need to kind of take charge. You are actually killing them by feeding them all this junk food. And if you go into a corner store, what do you have? You have like all the candies. Hey, listen, I, I love chocolate and dark chocolate's great. I prefer milk chocolate, but dark ch- chocolate is better. Cocoa for me. But hey, once in a while you want to have those, but because the environment is contributing uh, to us. And, and the, market, I, the, other th- and the marketing of, you know, by the food companies that are targeting children with all the cute little characters on the candy and on the, on the uh, cereal boxes, et cetera. Advertising oh, yeah. to the time of day when young children are generally watching TV. Yeah. And there's no sugar in Fruit Loops, right? None at all. None, none whatsoever. None. The other one is, is I, after <laughs> I moved away either. Made away from Coke, I went to Diet Coke, which has aspartame. It's like wood alcohol. It's actually in many ways worse for your brain. And yes, so now yes. I very rarely will have any kind of soda that's even diet, like maybe three or four a year kind of thing. I'm mostly a kind of a Perrier guy now. Right. Uh, with that, and then from there is lifestyle. No, I'm actually at a stand-up desk as we do this podcast. And the reason being is that we know that sitting is the new smoking, right? Yes. So yes. our body needs to move. I grew up in the dairy farm. One of the things that I do from a lifestyle point of view, because a lot of us sit and write or at computers and, you know, this virtual world that we're in and we're using technology, you need to include movement as part of your lifestyle. So both of my kids, I'm blessed that they, they're young kids, but they both have properties now acreages. So guess what? Dad is always volunteering to come over to do some chainsawing and cleaning up some yard, move some gravel, uh, do some renos with you. And uh, it fulfills me in serving them, you know, from a relationship point of view. But also, guess what? I'm being active. I need to do that to be alive. If I'm going to do a good job in this interview with you, I need to have the energy to do it and I can't do that if unless I'm moving. So we know, you know, all the stats around 10,000 steps or uh, Younger Next Year talked about having 45 minutes of activity five days a week at 65% or more of your heart rate. 
uh, for um, certain individuals. And I think, you know, more uh, for males is make sure that you're doing uh, weight training or your or women as well. Right. And so then you're doing yeah. muscle mass. My aunt many years ago um, got osteoporosis and she tri tripped on the front stairs of her house and broke her left leg into a million pieces. It just shattered into a thousand pieces. And then she was bound to a wheelchair, then her liver quit, and then she was gone within three years. So part of what will reduce that chance, not only eating right, but also movement, but this is where weights come in. But it doesn't have to be a big weight, just even resistance bands and making sure that you are strengthening those muscles. So when my father-in-law passed away from dementia, he was in residential care. So if people understand residential care, it really is, in essence, end of life. And what I just really noticed, there, this wasn't life in this place. I'm, I'm not trying to judge it. Is that This was just death waiting to happen. Right. There, I remember walking in to go see my stepfather-in-law, and they had a TV up on the wall, maybe a, you know, an old 36-inch set or something. There was 20 wheelchairs around it, and everybody was just asleep drooling in their wheelchairs. Right. That was the quality of life. And I said, don't be one of those. You need to move. And a lot of people says, oh, mom, you're 70. Stop, you know, stop walking so much. No, no, no. The opposite. This idea that when I'm elderly that I won't be able to move is a misnomer. It's not true. You it's can be active. True. So well, uh, Melissa support me on things. this one. I 100% I'm supporting everything that you're saying here. I agree with you. And one of the things that I really focus on in my work is teaching people how to live longer and die shorter. Because the reality is for the last 20 years, that's flipped on its head. And people are unfortunately living shorter and dying longer. So we go around saying our lifespan is lengthening, but what is the mm -hmm. quality of life for the last 10 or 20 years? That's the piece that is, has become a problem for people. And my grandmother lived to 101. She lived in her own home. She made her own meals and she was fully cognitively functioning. And that's who I want to be like mm. when I grow up. And that's my motivation. And that's what I want to teach to other mm. people that are open to learning because it is absolutely doable when we look at the whole being, we look at all of these aspects that we're talking about that impact our stress levels, and we follow a functional medicine plan. Mm. Well, one of the things that, and, and thank you for that, one of the things that they talk about in Younger Next Year is C6 and C10. And, and these enzymes, and I forget which is which, but one does when I, remember there, no pain, no gain when you were people were younger and doing weight training, so when I stress my muscles, it produces this enzyme that's sort of breaking down the muscle, which then actually causes the other enzyme to come into your system to be able to rebuild your muscle, right? Exactly. So why are you doing this resistance, these uh, person are, that are in these gyms doing the weight training? Because it actually gets results. So movement produces movement. The lack of movement produces the lack of movement. Yes. And so I'm going to be healthier. So there was a study done because mental health and wellness is this big thing now. And so Dr. Ahman, of course, has got PBS specials. He's got his newsletter and he does the brain scans. But it was interesting. He was citing a research study just not that long ago because we have a, a self-worth assessment as well about how people think about themselves. They proved in their study that walking and activity had more positive impact on mental wellness than any drug that anybody took at any time. The other thing, if you actually look at sort of a wellness and this mental condition for mental health for people, is that if you take these drugs long enough, they actually don't work. They actually cause you to be more suicidal long-term than, so, so what they're trying to prevent is actually what they contribute to. So I'm, I'm, I'm I'm okay with certain drugs when needed, but I'm really anti-pharmaceutical whenever possible. And when I was a nutritionist on the dairy farm, we didn't give cows drugs to perform. We always looked at the environment. We looked at the nutritional components. We looked at micronutrients and calcium and phosphorus and magnesium. We looked at all the ratios. We tested all the feed that the cattle got. You know, most of our animals, our dogs and cats are fed better than human beings right now because they have this sort of balanced meal within one area so that that pet 
can optimize its health. So the same thing here. The other thing that we included in this part of this assessment around lifestyle is that Harvard did the longest study uh, so far on longevity. It was 50 years. And the, the results just came out a year ago. And what they contributed, what, what were the top contributors, lifestyle decisions and activities that created the longevity for these individuals? Now, number one, they didn't smoke. Mm -hmm. So that's easy peasy. You got that one. Sorry, get that out. Vaping is smoking. Sorry, get it off the list. It's even worse. Number two is their alcohol was extremely limited or not whatsoever. What was also interesting, though, is this was more of a mindset than anything else is that they had a generous or generosity was part of their personhood. So there was a study done by a UBC professor and she gave her psychology students five bucks, Melissa. She says, what I'd like you to do is go out and uh, buy something for yourself or buy a gift for a friend to give it to them. And then she started to sort of in this uh, little micro study, uh, get a sense of what their happiness levels were. And whenever people bought something for somebody else, they actually felt better about themselves. So all the research is clear. It's better to give than receive is actually a true statement from a biological point of view. So volunteer, be generous. Don't be a prude. Don't be containing. And when we say generous, generous with your time, generous with your expertise, generous with your personhood, you know, be kind, uh, be open. Melissa, great to see you. Let's go have coffee. How can I support you? Um, you know, I, we've um, grown up sort of, uh, I'm a pastor as well. So I kind of have this giving side. So we used to have this men's breakfast, right? So I don't like to get up at 6.30 in the morning anymore. I used to do that when I had the dairy farm. But we get up at 6.30 and then there's 10 of us all cooking breakfast for a couple hundred people and eggs and bacon and stuff. It was a riot. And then, or these work bees that you would have with different events, like when our kids had at their school, we're putting up a playground, or maybe you're helping with the homeless, you're giving out blankets or it's food. So my encouragement is when you think about this lifestyle side is that uh, don't be self-centered and get out and volunteer and you actually will feel better and your longevity will increase as a result of that. The other thing that we put a mix, a mix in this is start selecting and having recreational events that are fulfilling for you. So there's just, I mean, there's working out and there's this fitness, 10,000 steps, but maybe you like hiking with a few people or going out with an individual, or maybe you like tennis or, you know, whatever it is that is a sport or a recreational activity that then enriches you that you enjoy doing. Uh, I, I played golf when I was in sales, you know, way back in the 80s. And then I really disliked it because it took six hours to do. And just two weeks ago, my daughter, who is 24, phoned and says, Dad, we're, we're uh, Tim and I, which is my son, we're going golfing tomorrow morning. Would you like to come? Are you kidding? A dad being invited by their kids to go golfing? And so I had some obligations, changed that. So 7.30 in the morning, which I, again, not a morning guy anymore, uh, <laughs> out there playing golf with my kids. And I said, wow. This, so that was enriching. You think that was stressful? That was just a joy, not only to walk the course and have fitness, but then to interact with my kids and play with them. And so these are the kinds of things that we need to insert into our life. And if you don't do it, it's not going to happen by accident. You need to kind of get on it and start doing it. So uh, those are just some clues that are in the assessment, but also we have a whole, we said planner. So I have a whole e-course that goes with it now as well to be able to get people to implement some of these steps. I love all of that. And uh, it's interesting because of course, at the time that this is being recorded, we are living through COVID and we do have restrictions, but um, I have actually come to really enjoy my online gym class. And all I need is a couple of different weights of resistance bands and my half roller and my ball, which I'm sitting on. So you're at a stand up desk, but I'm on a ball and I can wiggle and okay. wobble and use my core. And I have pedals under my desk so I can pedal away as well for movement because I am sitting right. for much of the day, but any movement is good movement, right? Mm. So there is so much that we can actually incorporate into mm. our day to do. We just have to know these little steps that we can take. And that's the value of doing your assessment because mm. then it really highlights where your score might be lower and where you have the opportunity to improve. Mm -hmm. The next section that we have in there, Melissa, is around time stress. 
So it's interesting, you know, let's just assume that life is uh, normal and at, for, for the examples of here uh, in this little blip in our lifetime is just gone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that being said is most of us are overcommitted and we don't build margins into it. So one of the things in lifestyle is around meditation or prayer or quiet time. And in our busy, uh, hang on, I got to have my phone with me, right? So the other side is being addicted to it. This is something that, you know, I was listening to one of your podcasts too, about, you know, blue light and not getting sleep. And uh, we have now got the serotonin rush that we're trying to get from uh, devices. And that's my that's my Achilles heel. I need to kind of let that go and set it aside. But one of the things around time management is, uh, have you actually set aside time for yourself? Mm -hmm. And, you know, are we over obligated? I remember there was a study a few years ago around 12 year olds, you know, they get out of school, then they go on their sports, then they go to their music, and then they go on and on. The 12 year olds didn't have any space just to kind of chill or hang out. And so we want to kind of build that in. And I says, who sets your schedule? You do. And you say, oh, no, no, they demand that at work for me. Well, hang on, who chose to work there? You did. So it's, uh, it was interesting. I can't say who this is because it was kind of confidential, but they are, they are very successful in a sales profession, but they're working 12 hours a day. And yeah, they're one of the top 1% of earners in the country, but that person just got a coach and the coach says, by the way, you're turning your phone off you are going to forward it to the office and you're going to go out on a date night with your wife like tonight. That's it. This is the first thing. We're going to discipline you so that you book in your own time for yourself. Yes, you're one of the top performers in the country in your profession, but you need to be able to take care of yourself and not end up like me because again, you get burnt out or uh, just it's all consuming. When years ago, when I first got in this industry, is that we're very blessed with being the sole source contract for all the soft skills for Chrysler Canada. And so myself and another individual owned the company and we had uh, trainers. I was on the road 300 days a year for nearly seven years. Just imagine that one year, in one year I had 150 airplane flights in a single year, yeah. not no, that's the, that wasn't the days away. That was the amount of times I was actually on an airplane. Nearly cost me my marriage. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was very good to me financially. But in the end, I really said, okay, uh, is this really serving me? Now, there was a little incident that happened back then called 9-11. And the week after that, they canceled our contract. We had 12 full-time people and we had to lay them all off. However, the godsend was, as I changed my mindset from being a speaker to, who writes to an author who speaks. So I then sequestered myself for a decade to rewrite all the tools and then really become more of an author. So we always have choices about how we're going to reframe our life, how we're going to set it up. And if you don't um, build it in, it's not going to work for you. So yesterday, you know, before we're filming, you don't need to say what date this is. I was working with another client and they said, can we'd like you to come in and do some uh, TV shows with us? And I said, okay. So they're starting an online TV show. And so the, one of the hosts is probably 30 ish. And he says, oh man, I'm tired. So now I know this is an opposite to what you teach, but it's okay. This is where he says, he says, he says I've had a nap for the last 10 years at this time of the day. And it's always worked for me. I mean, Winston Churchill did it right. And so he was setting up a lifestyle that worked for him, but we happened to be filming through his nap time. So here's this 30 year old asleep on the, on the couch. So again, start working as you talk about what works for you. You talked about the biome and how that nutrition, mm -hmm. but what environment works for you? You know, some people like working out in the morning, some in the afternoon, some in the evening, but how do I set that up? So the time stress, the time management is really nobody here manages time. People only manage events that get into the time that we have slotted. So this idea of a time management course is a play on words because no, nobody here controls time. We just control the priorities that go in it. So we all know, and we've all seen the illustrations of put the big rocks in first. Yes. What are the priorities? Then the next ones, then the next one. And my wife was an academic coach with uh, students at a university for a decade. And she had to teach them how to manage their priorities because most of them would go play and then study was last. And they said, no, 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 
you block in your study time. This is non-negotiable. Here's this hour on this day at the time that works for you. And then your gift to yourself is to go hang out with your friends in the wherever it is that you're going to do it. Right. So to what are those priorities? And once you discipline yourself around those things, then there's freedom that comes out of it. The other one, one of my mentors that I hired way back as a coach in the 90s, Dr. Alan Weiss, who's written probably 60 books. Uh, he says, why is 40 hours uh, a week the, or the 60 or 70 or 80? He says, if I work over 25, I'm, you know, that's, that's all I want to do. So again, you know, we equate this guilty. Oh, I didn't, you know, I, I quit at four today instead of like 5.30 like I normally do. Are you allowed to give yourself some space on that? So you set that up. So that's the whole time management and who's pulling on it. This other thing about do I say no or do I say yes when I want to say no? All these things of managing those, that personhood. And again, not from an arrogance point of view, from a self-centered point of view, but from a self-honoring point of view. And then the last section that we have. I okay, want to add in say, there. Yeah, please. Yeah, I love everything that you're saying. And again, if I look at myself six years ago, six years ago, I was almost letting myself be managed, right? And then as I went back to school, one of the first things I learned, and I've said this before on podcasts, is the importance of self-care and of honoring mm. yourself. And I have a saying that I created because it resonated so much with me, and I love to share it to resonate with others, which is that self-care is the most selfless act because it allows you to show up and give the world the best of you instead of what's mm -hmm. left of you. And what mm -hmm. that Agreed. mantra, which I recited to myself every day until it was ingrained, taught me to do was to actually schedule time every day, just exactly what you're talking about in my calendar. That was for me. And for me, it is morning time. So it is either mm -hmm. that gym work I work out I talked about or a yoga class or maybe an early morning paddleboard in summer. Mm. We had great weather recently. It was an afternoon paddleboard because it took that long to warm up. And so what happens though is I own that time. Nobody can take it from mm -hmm. me because I've made it mine. If something comes up that's gonna conflict with that time, now I have a choice. I have a choice to be able to move that time for that activity to some other time of the day or say no. Mm -hmm. And when we can do that for ourselves, we are in a much, much better place in terms of our stress level, in terms of our happiness. And I noticed that shift in me so, so quickly. And mm -hmm. as we care for ourselves, we become more stress resilient. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I agree 100%. And then the final one, because I know we have time restraints on your show here, is uh, around occupational stress. So the, the last research from now, this study is a few years old now, but it still was the most extensive research on employee engagement around the world. And that was Gallup's 142 country study. It said, what percentage of the world's workforce is engaged at work? In other words, like what they do. And it was 13%. So 87% or 90% of the population dislike what they do for mildly irritate the loathe. US and Canada had a little bit more engagement. So there were still over 70% who dis dislike what they do and other studies that fit into it. So if I'm doing something that's not a calling an assignment, my purpose, and of course that was the reason, the purpose of my purpose book. Yes. Is to help people to get clear about why you're here in what you're doing. Now, I understand where if you need a job to live in, uh, cover your food and your, your accommodations and yeah, all those things, fine. However, start putting yourself in a position, what do I really, really enjoy doing? So Melissa, you made a choice of moving out of the corporate world to create your own business in your own uh, destiny. Now it's not easy, but you can plan for it and you can have sort of an exit and you can say, okay, uh, what works for me. I remember when I had the sales uh, position in the company and I was the top performer after three years of growing the sales and I had a company car and my lunches were covered on, you know, weekdays. And I said, I was going to leave that to start my own sales training uh, program or, or company. My dad said, well, what are you doing? How stupid could you be? You get a company car, you get everything covered. Well, that company actually went bankrupt and closed five or six years later but there's gonna be all kinds of pressure around you. So what we ask in the stress uh, indicator and health planner around occupation, is it really serving you? Is it a connection? Again, it's not from a self-centered point of view. There's always stuff we're gonna have in our roles or responsibilities, businesses that we dislike doing. Life's not perfect, 
but can this be a nurturing and energizing and fulfilling event for you, occupation for you, career for you, calling for you, purpose for you, whatever verb you want to use. And you have to be responsible for that. And a lot of times people go down these pathways that they've sort of been instructed. So I, of course, third born, the third born, third generation, first born male for the dairy farm. And when I left it, what of course they said, you're a traitor, you're betraying the family. So the pressure, the societal pressure on what you should or shouldn't do is enormous. So my encouragement is, is that you would have people who would coach you, that would support you, who really are not, don't have, bring their bias. Family members are usually the last people you want to confide in unless they're extremely supportive of the direction that you want to go into. I mean, even remember with our kids and my, my son now is a very successful realtor and he's only 25, is he went through several different jobs to get there and he says, listen, you're on this journey of clarity. And I remember my uncle saying, I can't believe Tim's doing that job. That's not a very good job. I thought he was going to have his own business now. You know, he's just extremely successful in what he's doing. He loves what he's doing. He loves people. He loves business, loves real estate. And I said, what's my uncle got to do with this? Why, why would he even share that? So we have those components. Now, here's the other side is there's all kind of research around values clarification and lowering your stress. UCL, they did a study is that once I know who I am, my personhood, the self-awareness window that comes into all of this is that I can increase my resilience. I can increase my willpower. I can decrease my stress levels by knowing who I am. But here is what the majority, the majority of the people, 90% of the people that dislike what they do, mildly irritate the loathe. Here's why they're in that position in our opinion. And that is because they've not been willing to do the work. And when I say do the work, do the work to get clear, to spend the time to journal, to figure out why am I here? What, what am I doing? What am I good at? What do I love doing? What do I enjoy doing? And start being a student of your life and all your life is constantly leaving clues, but most people are not paying attention to it. So why don't I pay attention to that? And then with that, start to optimize who you are. Now, we also have a book called Why Aren't You More Like Me, which is on personality. And so the nature of your work. So you could, there's all kinds of ways that a profession can unfold. And it could be with your personality, but it could be with my personality in a different way. So I own a publishing company now, but I try not to do any of the operations. <laughs> That's for other people. They'll do the bookkeeping. They do the IT. They do all of that. I'm here to be the idea person. I'm here to be the communicator, to be the speaker, to be the teacher, which is what I love doing. Uh, but I shouldn't be doing these other things. So even those that are, that are listening and watching that are entrepreneurs, a lot of times you're doing too much and you're trying to save some money by doing the invoicing you said, hang on, time out. If you don't enjoy doing it, having somebody else do it for two hours a week and that they're an expert in it is going to free you up and stop draining your energy for the things that you dislike doing. And so this is so true. Now, this is in some ways it could be seen as a sad story, but my operations manager who had been with me for 30 years passed away last August uh, suddenly from pneumonia. Yeah. She had a respiratory condition and so got pneumonia and then as a result of that passed away. So as a result of that, uh, and you know, we're good friends, we know where she's at, she's, she's free of all the pain now, is with that is a lot of that operation stuff came to me. So I've been teaching this for 30 years and I've been living the hell side of it, pardon my language, because I had to start doing some of the operation stuff because there was nobody else that was really trained in our small firm. And so it was just a validation to me that I really need to be clear about what is it that I like doing, make sure that those things that I really disdain or are not good at or don't want to goes to somebody else. And then I can fulfill and contribute at the highest level for me. And again, this is not from a self-centered point of view, but from, as you mentioned earlier, from a self-honoring point of view. And I'm not doing a disservice to other people or, or I'm just, I just need to be into my space and to be able to contribute at this highest level and to say, how can be the majority of my life represent where I have my highest level of energy? And that's why I wrote the book, The Quest for Purpose, that then gives people a roadmap to get to that answer. And interesting enough, in 1989, when I got into this profession, I hired a coach before coaching was big named Mike McManus, who took me through this process myself. 
I knew that I was wanted to speak. I knew I wanted to encourage others, but I didn't know what the topic was and who my audience was. And so I spent six months and he lived in Seattle, Washington. I live in Vancouver, Canada. And I drove two and a half hours each way twice a month for six months to go and do sessions with him. This is before Zoom and before all of that kind of stuff so that I could get clear about who I am, what I'm contributing. And then of course, from there, you just continue to refine. You learn things about yourself constantly as you grow, mature, and expand. I love all of that. And thank you so, so much for joining us here today to walk through all of those steps of that stress indicator assessment tool and the importance of each of those steps. And you know, you've included tips as well that people can take away from today's show and start implementing. But uh, as we finish up here, just tell me how can people reach out to you? And we'll definitely drop the link to that stress uh, indicator tool into the show notes. But how can people connect with you? Well, we also have a gift for your listeners just oh, for awesome. your show. And awesome. so they can go to my speaker website, which is Ken Keys, K E N K E I S dot com slash health. I don't know how I came up with that. And so it, that's a hidden link for people that have listened to or watched this show. And we're going to give you a free download of the e version of the Quest book. So you're going to get that. Now, if you want to find out about the tools, we really suggest that you would go to Melissa and through her site, but you can come to our site to learn about them called crgleader.com. And in the show notes, you'll put your probably your partner link there, yes. Melissa, so that people can go through and find out more about the stress indicator, health planner, the personality, the values. So all of those things will, once you get that clarity, will give you a roadmap to lower your stress and increase your wellness and your health as an individual. And the other thing is, I think, Melissa, is that, if you want to do this for you, why wouldn't you do this as a gift for all the people around you, the people you care about? So those are the ways you can get a hold of us, crgleader.com or kenkeys.com slash health so that you can get that free gift. And then, you know, please reach out if you have some questions there. And I certainly appreciate the opportunity to kind of hang out and play with you today, Melissa. It's been really fun. And just as we finish up, I would love you to just, what is one thing, one last tip that you would like to leave the audience to inspire them to mm. take action in their health today? Well, I think, um, well, I have a bias around this, Melissa, is that uh, a lot of people discount their value and their worth in this world. And my encouragement is every single person watching, every single person listening, you matter. And the greatest gift that you can give to this world is to bring your best, bring what you have. And in fact, it's the most energizing for you. So why wouldn't you commit to that journey to have the self-care, to self-honor, to go on this journey of finding out about yourself, your stress levels so that you can bring this highest level and don't discount yourself. You are worth it, you are worthy, and you have something to contribute. Every single person watching this does. And so I just want you to take that. And if you know somebody who feels opposite or that same way, then you encourage them, you be, uh, the encouragement for them today so that they will take these steps as you do in this show, Melissa. And share this episode with that person as well. Absolutely. So hear it firsthand because you've given us so much information that I know even if I tried to repeat this to someone else, I wouldn't do it justice. So thank you again so much for joining us here today. I Thanks really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for exploring the secrets of success with us. If you want to keep the momentum going, log on to crgleader.com. Scroll to the bottom and sign up for our inspirational emails. You can also take your success to the next level by following us on Facebook and Twitter and connecting with Ken on LinkedIn. We hope you have a great week and look forward to you joining us next time for the Secrets of Success podcast with Dr. Ken Keyes.